All right, I am here with Jay and Wendy Pampazan, two titans in the real estate world. Wendy runs a bad ASS real estate team out of Austin, Texas. Have you expanded into other areas too? Uh, yes, we're in Houston and Minneapolis. So Minnesota. basically she sells a buttload of houses and is a very good agent. And then Jay is very prominent within the Keller Williams organization. A few of you might have heard of that. He's also the, how are you guys phrasing it? The author, the co-author, what's the Co-author. Word? Co-author of The One Thing, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Any other ones of note? Shift. Oh, shift. Yeah. Hold. Uh, what about like hold? hold. Uh, I was kind of the uh, developing editor on hold and flip. So I got to work. He's on very humble. Figures. He was the brains behind the idea. <laughs> so if you've read the Millionaire Real Estate Investor, also known as the Blue Book, Jay was behind that Millionaire Real Estate Agent, which before I was an agent, I listed as my favorite book when I was interviewed oh. on Bigger Pockets because that's how well written it is. Uh, Jay doesn't know this, but I have a love hate relationship with him. I love him as a person, but I hate the way he makes me feel because Jay writes so good. <laughs> That every single time I compare one of my books to his, it's like standing next to the rock at the pool when we take our shirts off. So you feel good about yourself and still until you look at uh, Jay Papazen's writing. So you really do set the standard for just the best way to communicate succinctly. I definitely recommend you guys should really read these books. Thing. No, and that's the only reason that I am still yeah. having some confidence because he's better than me at something that is not my one thing. There thank God. Go. But even the one thing concept, very nicely done there is a really good business book they wrote. So so you two are also known for uh, hosting the uh, a goal setting, is it retreat or conference? What do you refer goal to Goal setting as? retreat. Goal mm -hmm. setting retreat. We recently interviewed one of your uh, counterparts, Jeff Woods, who hosts the One Thing Podcast. And we talked about the importance of goal settings. Can you share a little bit of how setting goals has impacted your marriage and your business? Well, actually we're doing our goal setting retreat here at BPCon 2021. And we came in a couple days early and the goal setting retreat is something that we've been doing for probably like 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. We were looking at our numbers uh, yesterday and our wealth has grown more in the last year than it did in the first 12 and a half years of our marriage. And so we're seeing this like exponential hockey stick growth. And some of that's just compounding invest investments, but it's also the the continuing pursuit of of kind of our best life in all the all of our goal categories including investing yeah i mean it's also the compounding of the partnership but i think that the idea was born by wendy it was her idea she said i want to get out of the house and get on the same page mm. and i've got a questionnaire we're going to go through so i was actually initially kind of terrified by the whole idea <laughs> and uh and i think a lot of couples who go on a goal setting retreat there's a goal setter in which i'm traditionally a goal setter but the idea of doing it together with your significant other is a little bit foreign for a lot of people and uncomfortable. The, a lot of people go, what if we find out we want to go in different directions? Yeah. But I mean, if you're going to be together for a long time, you're going to go in different directions. So I think the idea was just about how do busy people with kids and everything else going on and investing is that new thing. How do we go on the same page? And uh, I don't know about you, David. I think one of the number one things that undermines investing is lifestyle choices. And so for investors, if you can get on the same page around like your household budget and like, okay, why we're not going to buy a new car this mm -hmm. year, because we want to buy future cash flow and an investment property, it makes it easier to follow through on those decisions. I would agree. I think that plays a huge role and it's not talked a lot about enough is the psychological impact of when you are living to the hilt and you, you can't afford the car. What happens is you know you can afford it, but you now don't want to take what is perceived of as risk to get into real estate investing. Mm -hmm. So I play these games with myself all the time where I still drive like a 2017 Camry uh, and I could afford a nicer car, right? But the minute I did, now when I'm looking at that deal and my what if brain starts screaming at me, what if it goes bad? I'm thinking, well, I have a $600 car payment. How does that factor into this? And I just, I just want to silence it. I don't even want to think about it until I have enough money that I don't care what that car costs. And you will hit a point at a certain time. Money is a skill that you build just like everything else. And it's, it's actually fairly predictable once you learn the, the rules of it. So for a lot of people that are new, I think that's fantastic advice. Where can you cut back on some of the luxury that you're giving yourself right now and force that gratification to be delayed? One of the easiest ways I've learned to look at it is I can have everything that my flesh wants or that my ego wants if my assets pay for it. Is that a similar philosophy to what you guys look at? Yeah, it's for straight sure. Straight Kiyosaki, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, right? for it, sure. Let your assets pay for, for luxuries. Luxury. Um, yeah. I like what you just said. I think discretionary spending is very relative to where you are. 
Yeah. And when we first started our journey, just being married, two people operating on one bank account is kind of tricky. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't say that I went to Target. And then she goes to Target. And not only do we buy too much of the stuff, but like we got a, you know, bounce check or something. So like in the beginning of the journey, you know, discretionary spending may or may not include the stuff right before you check out. Mm -hmm. But at a certain level, I mean, I don't think it'll ever be a private jet or a Lambo for me, but maybe a new new Camry for you. And and kind of finances aside, like I think that's all important, but just this idea of giving your partner the space to dream, because probably a lot of you listening right now are the goal setter. You're the kind of risk taker. You might be the adventurous one in your partnership. And giving your partner the space and opportunity to allow them to dream as well, when maybe that's not where they go naturally, is actually super powerful for your relationship, right? So if you're thinking about, hey, we, I want to go in this direction, let me explain why, and then you're giving mm. your partner the opportunity to say, yeah, I, I'm, I agree with that, or this is where I want to go, and really just being able to collaborate uh, you can look up and, you know, 5, 10, 15 years in the future, and you've gone places together that you wouldn't have otherwise. So. so I tend to be a person that processes information faster than my partners do. Usually I see an angle and then I very aggressively want to pursue it. What advice do you have for someone like me who needs to present the information and maybe let it marinate for a minute for everybody else to process it at their own speed? One of the cool tricks we've learned in KW uh, organization, Gary defines leadership as teaching people to think mm -hmm. so that they can do what they need to do when they need to do it so they can get what they want when they want it. It's a mouthful. But basically, we'll go back teach people to think. And one of the ways you do that is instead of giving people the answers, you ask better questions. Mm. And so sometimes you get there first. You can just – the great technique would be, so um, what do you think about that? and let them process the information. Or if you're sharing something, like, here's my aha, what does that mean to you? If you wait for them, you ask a question, it's polite to wait for them to answer. So I think just asking more questions. So what's an example of what that might look like between a couple where one of them, just as simple as, I want to invest in real estate, and the other one says, no, I want to put it in the 401k where it feels safe. I'm, I'm a little bit more of a risk taker, I think, than Jay, and he's more of a processor. And actually, the partnership has been really fantastic for everything in our life, for our relationship and our family and our investments, because I'm more like, hey, let's build the plane on the way up. And Jay's like, well, let's just let's 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 put a few directions together before we before we do that. And it's been it's been very, very powerful. So an example of how like you negotiate a compromise, like mm -hmm. part of the goal setting retreat is to do kind of someday or five year goals like. Who's got a crystal ball beyond that, really? Yeah. But you're like, what are some of the big things that we want to be working for in the future? And we all know how investing works, right? It's pretty, if you do the right things, it's going to happen, but it takes time. Yeah. And it might surprise you on the tail end how fast it comes. That's a great point. But um, I grew up in Tennessee. I like to hunt and fish. And in Texas, there's not much public land. And my son started wanting to go hunting with me and my guy friends. And he got to come along, and then sometimes the guy friends would be like, no, we're going to be smoking cigars or whatever. Like, it's not really going to be kid-friendly. And I was like, I don't love that I have to beg and borrow to do this really important childhood activity. And so I just said, I'd like for us to forecast getting a ranch someday. Mm. Now, uh, we still refer to it as the land yacht. This is not an investment. This I was is... like, no, we're not getting that. No. Basically. And um, yeah, I because it, it's expensive. It's mm -hmm. really expensive. It's not a good investment. I'm probably the thriftier of the two of us. And so it was on Jay's goals year after year after year. And, and, and after I'd been on your goals for about five years, we had an opportunity to partner with someone. And... Uh, that allowed us to share expenses and, and share the responsibility of this big piece of property. And because we had been talking about it literally for five years and I had shown, you know, because sometimes we have these crazy ideas and you put them out there one year. And the yeah. Next year, like, next year you're think? like, what? <laughs> you give yourself no. some time to let exactly. it work yourself out, right? Absolutely three, not. Years, I've been like, no, I still want that. Yeah. And so then when that opportunity presented itself, I was like, yeah, okay, we can do that. That's, you know, there's a lot of nuggets within that particular thing. A few that pop out are 
If you'd bought that ranch when you first thought, hey, I would like it, I don't want to, my son to not be able to go with me, that could have been financially catastrophic depending on where you were oh, in yeah. your career, right? Mm -hmm. But buying it five years later, now that's, it actually doesn't really have a whole lot of an impact, right? There's still like your car calculation. We okay. still look up and go, is, is this worth it? I still in say fact, yes. In fact, on the plane on the way here, I was looking over our stuff. I was like, oh my God, this ranch. <laughs> this we dead, spent so this much dead money on it. We're carrying around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, but, you know, happy husband, happy life, right? Yeah. Nothing yeah. rhymes with husband. That word, it never works the same when we try to say it that way. <laughs> I also like how you said, give yourself some time, right? Sometimes you, so, you have something you really want. You think you wanted that thing, but there was an element in that thing you wanted. It wasn't that. And time is a great way to kind of shake that out. And then the last piece, the part that kind of really speaks to me is when you have something you want, now you find motivation to get through some of the stuff you don't like. You can get through some of the boredom. You can get through some of the, why do I have to go and do this again? That Successful people are often remarkably consistently boring. They do the same things that work all the time. And you need little stuff like that to keep yourself motivated when, you, when that shiny object is calling you and you think, oh, I want to go do cryptocurrency investing. But when you're, oh, that might lose the wrench or it's easier to stay on the path. I agree. 100%. Yep. Yep, 100%. So another thing I want to ask you guys is Bigger Pockets is a real estate uh, education platform, but really their heart is to develop wealth so that you could be financially free. And there's more than one way to do it. Real estate is a great way to do it, but it's not the only way to do it. You two have done very well with building businesses and then sort of supplementing real estate or maybe real estate and supplementing businesses. Can you describe your relationship between how those two pieces work together? I can tell you how we got into it. So uh, when we first started goal setting and investing together, we set a goal like a lot of people is like, we want to be a net worth millionaire. And we set a cash flow goal that mm -hmm. would be our financial freedom number. And at that time, we thought if we could have 75000 in passive income without like a car note or a house note, we wouldn't have to work for anyone we didn't want to. And this was in our 20s, you know. Right. So we were like, that's 30s. a lot of money in our 30s. 30s. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. so uh, it was a while back and it was a lot of money to us. But the net worth goal started happening a lot faster than the cash flow goal. It's hard to cash flow properties at a high rate. Such a good we point. were in single family. Um, so it's even harder in Texas with property taxes. And we just asked the question well, how do we hit? Because you're doing this every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not going to hit those goals overnight. But you're on a journey. Like, what do we have to do differently? And so it started with Wendy starting a real estate business. Mm -hmm. One, because that would be super, super synergistic for what well, I do. And I actually started my real estate business because I wanted to save money on investment properties. Hmm. That's really why I got my license, because that I'd been doing that for a few years. Mm -hmm. And and then we got started and we were like, wow, we, you can buy a lot of investment properties now, you know. So. You had some decent coaching in that space, I would imagine. Yeah, coaching. we had a little yeah, bit. A great we had, coach. Great coach and Gary Keller and some of the people we get to work with every day. But uh, yeah, we looked up today and we have 11 partnerships and 11 properties. And so it's like the, they've kind of balanced out. One is better for cash flow. Businesses yeah. yield more cash flow. Mm -hmm. But in terms of building wealth as in assets, um, especially real estate businesses, they don't sell for big multiples, yep. right? Um, it's kind of like you have two pieces of the puzzle. That's, That's why we went there. That's a great point. Yeah. I'm going to add to it. And I just would say that it's a lot like investing, building businesses. Once you've built one, it's easier to build the second uh, one yeah. and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one. I think a huge stumbling block that many investors get into when they're new is they want cash flow because they're motivated to get out of some situation they feel pain. They don't like their job. They don't like their car. They want to get a better girlfriend, whatever it is. They think cash flow will solve my problems. And then they go about saving 50 grand to put down on a duplex in the Midwest somewhere and they get 300 bucks a month. And it takes a lot of those to <laughs> be able to replace your income yeah. versus what you two realize. And the same thing I did is I have more control over building my net worth. Mm -hmm. I can build equity and I have much more control over how successful I am. At cash, I'm sort of at the mercy of whatever the market's going to do. Mm -hmm. And then you convert that equity into cash flow properties at a better time. Yep. Is that a similar 100%. strategy? Yeah. It was 100%. actually in the research for the millionaire real estate investor. One of the number one things do people do to launch business is leverage equity and real estate property. Yes. So that wealth like makes you more attractive to banks. I mean, I also don't recommend starting a business on a lot of leverage, but mm -hmm. there's some businesses that require it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it gives you a lot more options. And in real estate, you can start businesses that are very synergistic. So uh, I've got a real estate team. I've got a real estate team in three cities. I have a, a contracting company. So we do home repair and remodeling. And all of that is very synergistic with your with your real estate properties. I love that point too. You're yeah, not you going out. mortgage and title and some of the places that people go when they get right, farther which along. Which we haven't. Yep, but, that's exactly. Yeah. It's different than going and saying, hey, I'm going to develop you know, the new MP3 player and I'm going to sell that, which has nothing to do with what right. we know. Right. Uh, would you mind sharing any predictions or insight that you have on what you think we can expect to see in 2022? Mm. Oh, you start. looked at me. <laughs> um, I think most people, every time I say this, we're wrong because something else happens. But I do think that we're everything points towards rising interest rates. Um, they've been kept down long because we had such a slow, like 11 year recovery from the Great Recession. And that's one of the few levers Mm -hmm. that the federal government has to kind of juice the economy. That and um, buying bonds, yeah. which they did in masses, and then they sell those off. The quantitative easing. Quantitative concept, easing, yeah. right? So they only have a few levers. And when the economy starts getting hot, one of the ways they cool it off is to raise interest rates. Because they kind of want to, they're always shooting for that 2%. Yeah. There's this kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, this you know Goldilocks moment, right, with interest rates yep. where it's not too hot, it's not too cold. You have healthy growth, which mm -hmm. is good for the taxing and all that other stuff that government does and good for the economy and good for everyone. And we're in a crazy place now. You know, there's parts of the economy that have insane inflation. Home yep. prices has been one of them. And they're probably going to have to raise those interest rates, not crazy, but it'll make an impact, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the, we were learning from Ashley Wilson, like the impact of one, you know, 100 basis points, yeah. one percentage point on a big multifamily. Yeah, when you get into those massive high price points. into the valuations. So I just think, prepare for that. Um, I personally think for, you know, your small investors, it's the, it's the person, the renters paying off the mortgage. Mm -hmm. So the interest rate, as long as you can cash flow it, actually doesn't matter that much. Right. But that is one thing I think people should be prepared for. What about you? Well, that was brilliant. So I'm not going to follow that. But, <laughs> um, I just would say that um, speculation is great. And when you're thinking about investing in real estate, uh, uh, Looking back 10 years, any decision you made was really a good one. So, so smart. There is never a bad time to buy real estate. Uh, you should never count on interest rates or the market going up. Just take action today and make sure you come to Bigger Pockets 2022. <laughs> That's a great. I tell all of our clients when they get that, oh, man, should I really do this that every buyer gets at some point? Think of anyone you know that bought a house 30 years ago. Have you heard one person that said, man, I wish we wouldn't have bought that real estate. It just doesn't happen. So, but in the moment, that person always thinks that they're spending too much or they're paying too much or it's a bad idea. Jay and Wendy Pappas in. Thank you guys very much for coming. <laughs> Thanks, man. Bye, guys.